So hi everybody, welcome back to the security stream of the GSE conference. Uh, most of you know me, I know, it's, uh, my name is Jamie Pease, I'm the, the chairman of the security working group. And before I hand over to uh, Mark Nelson to take us for a RACF update, um, just a couple of logistical things. So yeah, for the purpose of feedback, uh, as you can see there on your screen, this is session 1AY, so don't forget the QR code down there for uh, giving your feedback at the end. Just a kind of a recap on the, the way that feedback works, you know, it's important not only for the presenter, but also for us in GSE to kind of, you know, shape future conferences and, you know, what content is going to put on how we can improve etc but also it's very important for if you're collecting cpe or cpd points your certificate that you can download from my gse the content of that is built on the feedback that you give so if you're missing hours um, on your certificate when you download it it's because you haven't done your feedback so it's important to do that um, throughout this session please do use the chat um, to post your questions um and uh we'll be keeping a look out for look at those questions throughout and i think mark you're happy to take questions as usual um throughout and we'll uh, we'll stop you at an appropriate point uh, or you can raise your hand and you know we're quite happy to unmute your line if your question is a bit more tricky um going back to feedback again don't forget the best answer um for the first question is five um and then the rest of the questions the very best answer is nine um so uh, do keep that in mind when you do that so uh it gives me great pleasure to welcome back mark nelson um he's a very old friend now of uh, gse uk region and uh he uh he's, you know attends our, uh, our our annual conference for i don't know how many years it's been now mark and i know you do a number of sessions for us but just to double check that you're awake because i know it's very early where you are right now in new york um which model of plane if you can see it coming through is this <laughs> Uh, so, so the graphic is, is really, it, it, the effect, the visual effect is kind of stunning because I can only see part of it. Um, so the wings are actually just coming in, I, and now it's completely gone. Um, is is that one of the supersonic transport style? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it's a Concorde. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You can see it on its glorious because my background image, which I should uh, take off, but there you go. Excellent. That's the, there you yes. go. See, he is awake, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you ever get the opportunity to go to a museum that has one, and there are a couple of museums that have static ones you can walk through, um, it's it's really you know it's it's very narrow. It's it, it, it's an amazing piece, uh, amazing technology. I saw it in flight only once. I was it was actually um, I was driving to an aviation thing at Floyd Bennett Field. It's a small airport used now only by the New York Police Department, I think, in in New York City. And as I was driving along the uh, a particular roadway that parallels the approach, the SST was coming in for a landing, and uh, oh, it, it was wow. pretty. It was pretty cool. Uh, it was very. It, it, uh, it used to uh, arrive in New York around nine ten in the morning, and it, it would actually be a very distinctive noise. And folks who lived around the airport, as I did, uh, recognized that noise. And it was it was pretty cool to know that this amazing piece of technology uh, yes. was was flying right overhead. Thank yes. you. That's, that's fabulous. There you go. And uh, yeah, just for the, your, your your info, ladies and gentlemen, Mark is uh, Mark is a pilot. So, <laughs> yep. anyway, uh, over to you, sir. A student pilot, because every pilot knows that they're always learning. As yes. we are always learning about security on IBM Z, so that's the, what we're going to be talking about for the next fifty-five minutes. We are going to be focusing on RACF uh, because that's. The, the topic of uh, today's uh, symposia, shall we say. Uh, but um, I, I do want to point out that, in fact, this platform exists, or RACF exists in the context of a much larger thing. Uh, and right at the top of that, depending upon how you want to look at this, or as the foundation of all that we're doing, is the IBM Z15. So that's the next generation of the IBM Z technology. It's got more processors. It's faster. You've seen the speeds and feeds. I don't want to go through the to, to all of that. Just, just point out that there are things in there, like the system recovery boost, that will get you uh, uh, faster uh, startup and shutdown, uh, better performance on all the crypto kinds of things that we do, data privacy passports. And thank you, uh, Andy, for that session earlier this week or last week that talked about uh, data privacy passports. We had some sessions on HyperProtect and what that means. Uh, that's just fascinating stuff. I, I think that what we're gonna find is that the video archive that we're creating as a part of the GSE conference is, is going to be very, very useful as we start to use these technologies and bring them into our application environment. So just IBM Z15, that is the base for all that we are doing. 
So now let's talk about uh, Rack Effort ZOS uh, version two release four. These are the eight or nine items that we'll be talking about. We'll probably spend a little more time on some rather than others. Uh, and then there, I do wanna talk a little bit about some other things that are happening in these uh, ZOS security space. We'll hit that at the end and, and just let you know that there's some other stuff. I mean, there's always more stuff on, on IBM Z for ZOS. So again, let's, let's get going. We got lots to cover. Let's talk about pass tickets. So what is a pass ticket? A pass ticket is a uh, usually one-time use password substitute. We created the, the pass ticket back in the, the early 90s to address the issue of single sign-on applications, an application where you sign on once to some single sign-on application, and then you connect to IMS or, or TSO or, or Kix. Uh, simply by clicking on something. And under the covers, what would happen is that single sign-on application would generate this password substitute, this pass ticket, right? And the beauty of the pass ticket is that it would fit any place where you could put a password in. So you could put it on a TSO logon panel, a kick sign-on screen. You could even put it in JCL. You could say password equals and, you know, cut and paste in a pass ticket. Now, the, this concept of the pass ticket, it was based upon a couple of pieces of information. A pass ticket had to be dynamically generated and it contained information of, it was based upon the algorithm that generated, it used the user ID, used the application name, used the current time, and it, most importantly, it used a shared secret. And the shared secret was shared between the person generating and the person evaluating the pass ticket. So if you were generating them and evaluating them on the same ZOS image, life was good. You would go to the same password, uh, same store for this key. And we'll talk about what your choices were in a moment. Uh, you'd, you'd go to the same place for generation as for evaluation. So that was great. But you, you, you can generate this pass tickets on other ZOS, image, other ZOS images, or you can even generate them off platform. Now, I always caution folks, if you're going to gen generate them off platform, you really have to treat that shared secret, which has to be stored off platform. Uh, you have to tr treat that very, very, uh, with the highest level of trust, because if someone has access to that, they have the ability to become the user IDs associated with the application. Right, so that, that's the caution there. The algorithm is publicly uh, described. It's in the RACF macros and interfaces manual. Uh, and there are some reference implementations written for other, other platforms. So that's the intent of it. If you want more information, the security administrator's guide, or as I mentioned, the RACF macros and interfaces, that's where the actual algorithm is defined. Now, uh, we talk about this shared secret. When you generate the shared secret, you have the choice of putting it in uh, one of two places. You can put it in the RACF database as masked. And if you ask me, what does masked mean? I would say, I would use an, an analogy one of my colleagues used. It's kind of like Pig Latin. If you know the rules for Pig Latin, you know how to translate from Pig Latin to English. If you know the rules for masking, you can translate from that masked value into the clear text value. So obviously the, the masking is bad and I strongly encourage you, and we'll have some tools in a moment to show you how to do this a little more easily, that don't have masked values in your RACF, uh, ICSF keys uh, in your RACF data set. Put that information where it belongs into ICSF. And the way you do that, uh, when you're defining the pass ticket uh, profile in the PTKT data class, you would say SS sign on, single sign on, that is the segment name. You would say either key masked to say put it in RACF or key encrypted to put it in ICSF, right? So just remember, it's very sensitive information that key value, please never make it one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, a value like that. It should be a randomly generated value through some mechanism. Uh, but yeah. Uh, make sure that you put it in the most secure place, which of course is ICSF. So a uh, couple of things, if you were to go out and list this pass ticket profile, uh, if it's key masked, we would simply say, hey, it's key masked and we're not telling you anything. And when it's key encrypted, we'd simply tell you, hey, it's key encrypted. And that's all we tell you, we tell you the type. Well, starting in ZOS V2 R4, that R list will now tell you if it's key encrypted, it'll tell you the actual label right, the label of that key object in the ICSF data store. So there you have it, key label ir.signon.sys1. It's a long, complicated name. It looks like it was system generated because it was system generated. You notice there really was no option in, in the uh, ICSF case to tell us anything about the key label. So we generated one for you. 
how nice of RACF. All right, so now we tell you what the key label is and database unload and IRXUtil and our admin will all also give you the key label information. All right, but what if you have masked profile, masked uh, ICSF keys and you want to move them into ICSF? So I should say masked RACF database keys and you want to move them into ICSF. Well, we now give you a much simpler way of doing that. And that is with the encrypt key. I don't wanna say it's a keyword. I don't wanna say it's an option, but if you say S sign on encrypt key and it's an R alter for a pass ticket profile, we will convert it. We will take it from the RACF data set, unmask it, um, convert it into a key store object in ICSF and then store it into ICSF for you. Right? So this is a nice, easy way to move from key mask into encrypted key, much better technology. If you want to do this for all of your, your pass tickets, you can use the RACF search command to generate a C list that will have the, uh, the command that will do the R alter with this SS sign on open print encrypt key. So very straightforward to do, but as always, I, I caution you, you know, we always tell you sort of the end piece. We describe the icing on the cake. The foundation to this cake is of course, you have ICSF properly set up, properly configured, and of course, properly backed up. All right, so we talked a bit uh, a moment ago about if you're creating a, an ICSF style pass ticket key, we generate a key label for you and that's absolutely true. But starting in ZOS version 2.4, if you want to predefine that key and assign it your own label, right, using, some, using the usual set of ICSF commands, and then you want to associate that key object, you can do that now. The R alter command in ZOS v2 R4 will now ex ex allow the specification of a key label. All right, so this way you create the object in ICSF, it never appears in the clear outside of ACS, ICSF, and you simply point to it using the new key label uh, keyword on the uh, secure sign-on segment of the uh, ICSF profile, the PTKT data, PTKT data profile. Uh, that's a nice enhancement. I kind of like that. So you don't have to now rely on IBM's uh, naming algorithm. You can have your own. Uh, simplification thing. This is just one of those little things that had annoyed people. It annoyed people in IBM, annoyed me. Uh, when you were configuring ICSF for, for RACF's use, you had to play some games and put some modules into LPA and you no longer have to do that in ZOS version 2.4. RACF made some changes. Now, I mentioned that this uh, pass ticket consists of the user ID, the application name, uh, the current time, and the shared secret. Uh, one of the issues you get is when a pass ticket comes in, we don't know if this value, this eight character string is a, use, is a password or a pass ticket. Right? So we go through some processing and we look to see if it's a password. Oh, it's not the valid password for this user ID. Let's see if it's a pass ticket. Now that we're looking through it as a pass ticket value, we could reject it for a couple of different reasons. One of which is the key is not, uh, wasn't correct. One of which is the time is not valid, right? Now the pass tickets have a lifespan plus or minus five minutes from the time that was used at the time they were generated. So they have a finite lifespan. If they get delayed in transit uh, beyond that, they're simply not gonna be valid, but you don't get any indication. It simply shows up as a you know, wrong password was specified. So. Uh, when we did the MFA support, we introduced a new relocate section in the SMF type 80 record, and that was relocate section 443. And the event code one is the, the job initiation, or the, you can think of it as the rack and it record. And now we're updating in ZOS of, of 2.4, that relocate section will give you some additional information. So for example, if the validation is not correct, you'll get some information that might help you diagnose why. We'll tell you some information about the, the time offset from the time it was generated to the time it was evaluated. And we'll also tell you the application name that was used in the evaluation process. Now, remember I said there's an application name that gets passed in as part of this. Well, if you don't pass it in, there are some default rules that RACF will follow to generate an application. And we have to have an application name. If it's not passed in, we will do some defaulting. And that defaulting may, may not be valid in, in your environment or may, may be different from the generator to the evaluator. So this will give you a little more information to help you diagnose those processes, those, those kinds of issues. The other change we're making is that when you're generating a pass ticket, there are some situations where it might not be successful. And rather than just saying it didn't work, we now give you in register zero, 
a reason code that'll be a little more specific as to why the generation failed. So some nice diagnostic enhancements. All right, and take, ask questions any point along here. Uh, Jamie will be monitoring and will interrupt me. I speak fast, we have lots to cover. All right, let's talk about custom fields. Uh, custom fields, we introduced custom fields back uh, a number of years ago. Uh, COS 15, 14, 16, that time frame. It's been around so long. Uh, and, and people love custom fields. And what's the concept of a custom field? It allows you to define fields that you want associated with user profiles or group profiles. You get to choose the name. You can put some tailoring in there to make sure that there's some basic validation done. Uh, and then once you've done that, these look just like fields in the RACF database. If you do a list user, they show up. The, if you can use alt user or alt group to, to set them. Uh, really is a very, very nice function that absolutely everybody, everybody loves. One of the most popular things we've done. And just as a refresh, how do you do this? Uh, it's all about defining profiles in the C field class, right? The custom fields class. So you would define a profile in the C field class whose name was the type of profile that it was, user or group, dot CS data, that was fixed, dot M, then the field name, in this case, MCR. And then in the CF def segment of that profile, you give us some information about the characteristics, the lengths of it, the data type, is it numeric, is it character? If it's numeric, what are the, what's the lowest possible value? What's the highest possible value? What information do you want dis uh, displayed when somebody does a list? So you do that field definition, you know, one, one profile, then you uh, activate the class. You have to run dynamic parse to make sure that our command processors now know about this. And then you start using the fields, in this case, something like alt user coop, CS data, MCR, one, two, three, four, five, six. Right, it's a serial number for that particular person, Mr. Ross Cooper. And if you list that profile, look, it just shows up like it would any almost any other field in the RACF database. And again, works great for users and groups. But what about data sets and general resources? Um, when, when I would go to other conferences, uh, this would be the number one requirement that we would get. And in fact, it was, uh, we, we got it so often that it almost became a running, I won't say a running joke, but you know, I, I would go to the requirement session at a certain conference and they would literally just take last year's requirement and photocopy and hand it to me again. Uh, pointing out that you know sometimes it does take multiple requests to get things like this done. So please, if you're ever wondering, should I submit a requirement? I'll give you the link at the end. Yes, please do. And especially submit them through conferences where we accept requirements, share the Vanguard conference and things like that. All right, so what about data sets and general resources? Well, I wouldn't bring up that question if we didn't have in ZOS version 2.4, the ability to do custom fields for general resources and data sets. And it works almost identically to the way it works for users and groups. We're still using the C field class. The biggest difference is the first qualifier in that profile is now going to be data set or general. Uh, second qualifier will be CS data. The third qualifier will be the field name and the rest of the rules apply. It's pretty much very straightforward. Uh, now, one thing to note, if you're doing something for a general resource, it will apply to all general resource classes. There's no way here in the definition of the field to say, nope, nope, this, this particular field only applies to this individual or this set of general resource classes, but you can write an exit if you wanted to do some kind of enforcement. And I know some people, I had the camera on at some, some people say an exit, oh, I've got to write a sampler. Relax, we got you covered. We'll talk about that in just a moment. In fact, we're gonna talk about it right now. Uh, you don't have to write that, that in assembly, you can write it in Rex. And uh, a hat tip to my buddy, uh, Bruce Wells, who's done so much work and, and other folks in the RACF development team to make some, so many of the RACF interfaces work so well in a Rex environment. So there's a new Val Rex keyword on that custom fields definition where you can define the name of a piece of Rex code that you want to run to do the validation associated with it. So, yay. Don't have to write assembler. Uh, let's talk about two, th uh, these are actually two separate topics, but I lump them together because they really are so intertwined. And that's the R admin callable service and the IRRX util uh, Rex interface into RACF. So let's just review very quickly. The R admin callable service, it's a callable service where authorized callers, and it's authorized, meaning certain RACF permissions have been set up. These authorized callers can call RACF and run RACF commands, right? So you can run a list command, run an alter command, uh, 
do all the RACF kind of administrative commands. Of course, not only do you need the ability to use our admin, you need the, the privilege to actually execute the command. So we're not expanding the privileging of what you're allowed to do. We're just giving you an alternate way of getting the commands into the system. You don't have to log on to TSO. You don't have to submit a batch job. You can invoke this callable service, which will route the request over to the RACF address space and then execute it under the identity usually under the identity of the invoker, of the person who issued the R admin request. So that's, you can run RACF commands. That's all I'm gonna say about that. Uh, you can retrieve information about your RACF environment. So you get user and group profiles, you can get general resources, you can't get data sets. You can't get data sets. That's, well, up until now, that's the reason why I'm telling you this. You get information that's uh, et cetera, ops system, uh, RACF configuration information. You get information about your RACF remote sharing facility. You can also use our admin to update configuration rules. You can also use our admin to update uh, profiles in the RACF database. So you just notice that uh, you know, three sets of functions. We're gonna talk about pretty much uh, only one of them here. And that is in the retrieving security information about the RACF database. You can now retrieve information about data sets, right? And in addition, in addition, our admin now has um, well, actually supports custom fields. We'll talk about we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, so you can use uh, you got you can use data sets now. That's that's the big change here. Now the reason why I put these two things together is that uh, the Rex interface into RACF IRX Util, the one of the best interfaces I think we've ever created. Uh, hat tip to my colleagues who made this happen. Uh, the, the this Rex interface is built on top of our admin. It's built on top of that set of interfaces. So what does IRX Util let you do? Well, it allows you to do a lot of the things that our admin lets you do, like extract information from profiles, specifically user group, general resources, but not data sets. You can extract setter ops information and you can extract RACF remote sharing information. Notice the parallel to, between our admin and IRX Util. So when our admin supports data set profiles, guess what? Yay, IRX Util will support it as well. So for those of you who are Rex aficionados and let's face it, who isn't, uh, you now have the ability to get RACF administrative information about data set profiles and ex you know, bring that into stem variables into your Rex coding. In addition, right, the other addition we made is the ability to extract information about the class descriptor table. And that's the CDT uh, where you define, where IBM defines its set of classes and of course the set of classes that you can augment in the uh, user specification, the user uh, class descriptor table and IRX Util will allow you to process both. And that's pretty cool. All right, let's talk about RSF for a moment. So the concept of the RACF remote sharing facility is that I might have two different nodes. I don't know, I have an MVS system with RACF here in Poughkeepsie and I have an MVS system in, I don't know, London also with RACF. Now that's a little bit too distant to actually share the actual RACF database. Uh, and I don't, maybe DASD configuration allows you to do that nowadays, but uh, you might wanna have a logical association where if I do an administrative command against this system in Poughkeepsie, it'll be replicated based on some policy that I've set out to the London system. And similarly changes made over there replicate and come over to the Poughkeepsie system. And that's what RACF remote sharing facility lets you do. Came in back in RACF 2.2, somewhere in the mid nineties. Uh, when it first came out, you had one choice. You actually, you could use any communications mechanism you wanted as long as you wanted APPC. Uh, in ZOS um, 1.13, I think it was, we introduced the use, the ability to use TCP IP. And if you haven't moved over to TCP IP, I strongly encourage you to do so, uh, mostly because of all of the protections that you can get, the transport layer security protections that you can get in through using TCP IP and ZOS comm server that you could not do using APPC, right? So that's, that's the basics of, of what RSF is and the way it works is on each system for every system to which you are connected. So my London and Poughkeepsie examples, in Poughkeepsie, I've got two vSAM data sets, one data set which represents the outbound work and one data set which represents inbound work coming in from London. And in London, it's got two vSAM data sets representing inbound work from Poughkeepsie and outbound work to Poughkeepsie. So of course you can see how this multiplies if you have you know, four systems and connecting to four systems, well, you've got eight sets of these data sets um, on each system. 
Now, the data that's in that VSAM data set is masked, and all the things that I said about masking for past tickets apply here. Masking, in, in this case, we it's, it's something called CDMF, it's the Commercial Data Masking Facility. It's 40-bit DES. Now, if you don't like DES, you're really not going to like 40-bit DES, right? So, now, the, one of the challenges, it's, it's a VSAM data set, and it turns out that when IBM did its pervasive encryption work, uh, we enabled pervasive encryption for extended format vSAM data sets. Well, if you happen to have a an RSF data set that is a VSA, that is a uh, extended format vSAM data set, then well, yeah, you can make that a an encrypted data set using the standard set of pervasive encryption uh, technology. So if you're starting from scratch, yeah, you can do that. But if you have an existing RSF data set, uh, we're now giving a, an ability to migrate from that data set into a new vSAM data set. So there are two new keywords, new, pre, new prefix and new workspace, which will allow you to allocate a new vSAM data set for RSF and then transition from your existing one into the new one without disabling, without stopping your RSF node. Uh, and that's pretty big. And it just happens that if that new data set is encrypted, that works just fine. So uh, nice, I like that. I think one of the things I'm learning about IBM's pervasive encryption journey is as the infrastructure is created, more and more people can take advantage of that infrastructure without having to invent their own encryption mechanisms. Right? You can, I don't wanna say piggyback onto, but you can build on top of that Z15 base and you can build on top of the building blocks that the people in the data facility product have done for us, good stuff. All right, I'm gonna pause for a, a, a quick drink. Are there any questions, Jamie? Uh, not at the moment, no. But uh, yeah, like I said, uh, uh, as Mark said, any questions, pop them in the chat. Okay. Um, yep. Good, I, you know, if I had chocolate, I'm sure there would be, be, be questions. And yes, I, I'm sure there would. <laughs> I, I, I almost had a bowl of chocolate here and I was gonna to promise to eat one <laughs> for every question. Uh, <laughs> bad idea, okay. Let's move on to uh, the next topic, ACEE modification detection. Uh, RACF security administrators usually don't worry too much about the internals of what's going on in ZOS. System programmers are always worrying about the internals of what's going on in ZOS. And this concept of the ACEE, the accessor environment element is a really interesting intersection uh, between those two worlds that the security administrator really needs to understand a little bit about this to understand what ACE privilege detection is. So let's talk quickly about what this accessor environment element is. Well, first off, it's nothing more than a control block. It's a piece of storage that is sitting around uh, in the operating system. When I say piece of storage, there are many, many of these pieces of storage in your ZOS environment. Now, the concept of the ACE is it's, the, some people call it the security context. It represents the key characteristics of a particular user, or more importantly, of a user identity as it's assigned to a piece of work. And that's really the important part. It's a user identity that will be assigned to a piece of work. Every, every task in ZOS has an associated ACE with it, either explicitly or implicitly based upon the context of that task, right, or the type of request that's being done. Now, what information is in the ACE? Well, the user ID, the one to eight character string that identifies you uniquely in a ZOS environment. It also contains a list of the groups to which you're connected. It actually contains two of these, one of which is fixed at the time that you that the ACE is created, and a second one which can be modified during certain RACF processing. Right? So if somebody, we, we, when the ACE is created, we have these two list of groups, they're identical. Then if somebody connects you to a group or disconnects you to a group, one of them will stay exactly the same, and the other one, RACF may modify with the current list of groups. And the processing would do that is it's usually a rack check type of environment, but we have these list of groups. Uh, really importantly in there are a set of indicators that represent your global provisions, uh, permissions for this user ID. And by that, I mean, do you have special? Do you have operations? Do you have auditor? Do you have the read only auditor attribute? Now there's lots of other environment information in there. For example, how did this user come into the system? Was it an NJE job? Was it a batch job? Was it 
was it a started task? That kind of environmental information is also stored directly in the ACE. And then there are pointers to lots of other information, some of which is security relevant. So there are pointers in there to some user data fields that will get populated automatically, or sometimes people have third party products that populate those. Uh, there's a pointer to an 80 byte value called the U token which is kind of a very, very distilled version of the ACE that contains basically the user ID and the group ID and some other information that you can transport to other address spaces and to other systems to create an, an ACE that's like the one that, that, was, that we're, we're talking about here. But the point here is it's a very, very, very important control block. Now, who uses it? Well, RACF is the, I almost said RACF is the creator technically, SAF is the creator, the system authorization facility. The system authorization facility really is owns the ACE, which means that if you're using other products, they should be creating one that's consistent, right? Certainly consistent with what their needs of their products, but there are some uh, fields in the ACE that all of the products have to set because certain programs will look at these and they don't care whether it's ACF2 top secret, um, or RACF, right? They don't. They 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 just want to know that when they look at this offset, they'll find something like the user ID, and and those field values are defined very clearly right at the top of I think it's data areas, is where we define what those uh, general use programming interfaces are, right? Uh, but you know, RACF is going to use this. It's going to look at that list of groups. It's going to look at those list of attributes. Hey, you've got the RACF special operand. Hey, that means you can do this set of commands. Oh, you've got the RACF auditor bit set in the AC, that means you can do this, this set of things, right? So RACF uses these extensively and other products will be looking in here as well. Now I mentioned that there's always an AC associated with a task, with, a, with, with the threat of execution. Uh, and I, I didn't say it's associated, uh, I didn't, I hope I didn't say it's, you know, in the TCB there's a pointer to the AC. Well, there is, but it doesn't have to be set. And that's what I meant when I said it can be set by context. So the way this works is ACEs can exist fundamentally in one of three places. The first place they can exist is it's associated with the address space. ASXB, uh, which is a control block, there's one per address space, points to the ACE. Uh, you will almost always have one of these. Uh, in, in fact, I would say if you don't have one of these, it's probably an error situation and it was deleted accidentally or you're in a transition state when the address space is first being created or you know, being uncreated, being destroyed. But the, the top level one is the address space level ACE. Then in an address space, you have always have a number of tasks. Any of those tasks could have a task level ACE that can be different from the ACE associated with the address space. And the way this works is every resource, okay, but when RACF is asked to do something from a resource manager, RACF first says, let me look at the task ACE and I'll use that to make my access control decision. And if that's not there, then I'll use the address space level ACE. So the system anchored ones are either at the address space level or at the task level. There's a third way one can do it. A resource manager can create an ACE and just stick it off on the side. This is done commonly by, uh, by some of the database products, IMS, DB2, uh, Kicks as well. Uh, they create the AC and, and stick it off on the side. And then when they wanna make an access control check, they say, hey, RACF, does this ACE have access to this resource? So in that case, if they're telling us directly what the ACE is, we don't look at the, at the address space level one. We don't look at the task level one. We trust that authorized caller to be passing in the right ACE. So that's the concept of the ACE. The function that you get in ZOS V2 R4 and actually rolled down to all supported releases like ZOS V2 R3 is you have the ability to detect changes in an ACE that will result in an elevated privilege. Right, we'll talk a bit about how to enable it, very simple to enable, uh, but when RACF detects that the ACE was created this way and now when we're looking at it for the purpose of doing an authorization check, we see it's something different and that difference represents an increase in the authority that can be used, then we will issue a message to the console. Right? Now, how do we do this? When the AC is created, when a RAC route request equals verify, Enver create is issued, RACF will create, uh, think of it as a fingerprint, right? A little chunk of information that concisely represents the state of that AC. And that fingerprint encapsulates the user ID and a set of things that we think are important special, trusted, things like that. At the time the AC is used, 
we're going to look at the AC that's being presented to us or the one that we have gotten from ASXB Send or TCB Send, the two pointers in the control blocks. And we'll compare the values in the AC with that sign, that fingerprint value. And if there's a difference, boom, we'll put out a message that'll tell you a little bit about what we found. And we'll look at that message. We'll discuss that message in a moment because I, I wanna be very clear about what that message is telling you and, and more importantly, what it's not telling you. So let's take a step back. Why would anyone want to manage, manipulate an ACE? Hey, it's an IBM control block. I get it, hands off, you shouldn't be touching it. Yeah, in the real world, people have reasons. I mean, you have business objectives, you have jobs that you need to get done, you have applications that have to run a certain way. So why would somebody modify an ACE? Well, it's, there are some situations where it's the only alternative that you have to get an application to run the way you think it should run. Right? You don't want to have this application being bogged down by security checks that fail. I, and I know from a security perspective, even as I said that, my skin was crawling just a little bit. But years and years ago, that was the only choice that you had. The only way that you could have something run the way it needed to run was to simply say, I have all privileges and uh, you know, I'm, I'm just going to take them. And that's it. Over the years, we've seen more functionality introduced into ZOS and to other places in, in the operating system that allow you to have a more fine grained permission scheme. So you no longer have to grossly require this requirement that says, hey, I've got RACF special or I have RACF operations. RACF operations, of course, allows me to open every data set unless I'm on the access list explicitly denied or turn on the trusted flag or whatever it might be. So. The, the set of applications in that first bullet that are, you know, and there are no good alternatives, that's gotten smaller and smaller and smaller to the point now where if you have an application that's claiming that, I would ask that you, you push on them and say, no, no, prove to me that there's no alternative. Now, second characteristic, you might have an application that could use one of these new functions. And let me just use one example. A few releases ago, uh, our colleagues over in DFP introduced a new option on the DCBE, I think it was, one of, the, one of their control blocks, right? a documented function, uh, a documented external, where when you, if an authorized caller was opening that DCB and that flag was set, that flag would say bypass the RACF check, right? You had to be an, an authorized caller, APF authorized, uh, supervised state, whatever the usual rules are for that, for that, for that type of facility. But as importantly, our friends in DFP wrote SMF uh, 1415, the open data set records, and they put an indicator in there that says, hey, I was just called, and the person who called me said, don't call RACF. So they, they recognize that the power of giving a facility to bypass a RACF call doesn't mean you should be able to suppress the log record that would come from that. So again, that's an SMF record. That's not the SMF 80 record. It's a DFP open record. Just an example how somebody who years ago would say, well, there's no way for me to be assured that I can open that really critical data set. So I've got to take, you know, change the ACE to give me the privileging to do that. You no longer have to do that, right? Small setting in the, uh, in the DCB or one of its related control blocks and, and you can get that same function. So you may find as, as you look and see you have applications playing with the ACE, you might be able to upgrade those, ACE, uh, those applications and substantially improve your security posture. Uh, the next case, you might have a well-intentioned application which does not adhere to the principle of release privilege. Uh, one of my fundamental rules is that nobody ever complains if they have too much authority. So if you have somebody with APF authorization, uh, the ability to, to put something into an APF authorized library, they might say, well, I, you know, the simplest thing to me to work for me to do to make sure my application works is I'm just going to flip every bit I need in the ACE so that I'll never fail. You know, great for availability, except when somebody figures out how to circumvent that control and use it for nefarious purposes, in which cases it's absolutely awful for availability and awful for security. Uh, but I think we really have to make sure that folks who are, you know, good intentions alone aren't enough. You have to follow the good practices of security, least privilege being one of the foundational and fundamental one. Other cases that we've seen, you may well have a, uh, an, in, an application or a small piece of functionality that you've written 
uh, for some very specific purpose. And the systems programmers here, I, I, I don't mean to pick on you, uh, but in, I, I was a systems program a number of years ago, and it was very, very common to have the Magic XVC, uh, which no one was supposed to know about, but would grant you some kind of extraordinary authority, like set, a, set the JSCB off bid or you know, do something else. Right? Usually that's outside of the system's uh, security policy, because very rarely do you have a security policy that says, here are the rules, and they don't apply to systems programmers. You know, it's, just, it's not the way businesses run. So uh, you may find that you have these, and you may find that AC privilege uh, detection will, will identify them for you. Uh, the thing that we're all worried about is, of course, you may have malware that's been uh, <laughs> introduced by an outsider or an insider. And the insider case, as we all know, is, is the much harder to validate, much harder to detect case. Well, here's a case, an ability to detect if you've had something like that happen. Uh, you also might have the ability of somebody finding a vulnerability, right, finding something that they could exploit that allowed them from an unauthorized state to go into an authorized state, which then allowed them to manipulate bits in the ACE. So we will give you an ability to detect that last part there. Uh, and, and perhaps give you a leg up on identifying what the vulnerabilities are. But, uh, but that's the concept of ACE modification detection. So when do we go out and, and validate these fingerprints? Well, we validate them when the ACEE CHK, ACE check class is active. And here's the message that you'll see. We'll spend just a moment talking about this. Uh, it's IRR421I, AC modification detected. And then we're gonna tell you as much as we possibly can about this. So we'll give you the user ID, the address space number in hex, the job name, the program name, and the function that was called that, that actually did the validation and detected it. Now, when this happens, please don't go you know, running down the hall looking for TSO user eight and threatening him saying, you just did something, blah, blah, blah. Right? it may not have been him. You really can't, this, this is a detection. This tells you something bad has happened. There's some investigative work has to happen to find out why did it happen? What kind of application did this? Was it a well-meaning application that TSO user eight just happened to use, right? Which did some setting. And then when he actually did something in RACF, well, that's when the exception came out. So point here is that you have to look at this message and, and use a little bit of the utility that some people don't use as much as they should. And that's the IEB think utility. The IEB read it, understand it, and then take the appropriate action, which is, all right, we figured out something has happened, start the investigation. Hey, what were you doing user eight? Oh, you invoked that application. Hmm. Let's go look into what that application does. So as I said, it's likely that you have some programs that will trigger this. And as we were doing the development for this, we found a number of IBM programs that were triggering this. Uh, and we work with them because in a lot of cases, there were alternatives that could be considered and could be used. And we, we got them to change their code. And that of course has the, the lovely benefit of, I think, increasing the security posture of the, of the entire operating environment. So uh, we had some, it's probable that you may have one or two, and there is an exception process. If you want to go out and say, no, I believe that this application, you know, for whatever reason, I've done the proper risk assessment, I've evaluated it, and I'm willing to live with the risks that are associated with it, I can create an exclusion, and it's by you create the exclusion by defining profiles in the ACE check class, uh, and it's IRR.exclude dot the program name. And we can have a long discussion about program names and stuff like that. We'll defer that for later. Uh, now. If you get to a point where you actually are running with few exceptions and you want to go into a more active mode, you can actually force the failure of that rack check with the compromised ACE. And all you have to do to do that is IRR.admins.on.failure, define that profile in the ACE check class. And if you do, and a ACE fails the fingerprint validation check, and rather than just issue the message, we will abend the requester with the abend for Charlie six with a new reason code of 4766, or interestingly, ACE. Would put the extra E on, but reason codes can't be that big. Has anyone done this? The answer is yes. I do know of one large financial institution that as soon as this support came out, was running with it. And uh, within the last few months, I believe it was, went into failure mode. 
So if you're thinking about that, I would strongly suggest running in non-failure mode for a, a enough time to make yourself comfortable. Uh, any questions? I'm going to pause for a sip. It is only water, alas. We do have a couple, yes. Um, oh, good. Len, Len, Lenny on AC, he said the JES in initiators also do not have, need to have the ACs while they're not running jobs. Ah, thank you. Yeah, I, it's, I, I, I consider that kind of a transient state, but you're absolutely right. And, and initiators that's sitting there waiting for work. Uh, yeah, I, I've, I've stumbled into that. But I'll be honest with you, a lot of times when I see uh, the, the uh, ASXB pointer zero, it's because somebody attempted to delete a task level ACE. And it's very easy to not do right, unfortunately. And they didn't delete the task level one, they deleted the address space level one. Uh, and yeah, you, you'll see an, a, a very interesting ad bend during, uh, during job termination, I think it was when that happens. But yes, a good point. Uh, that's one of the times when that, I consider that to be the address space is sort of transient. Thank you, Lenny. Um, we've got one. Sorry if I get your name wrong. Vianif. Vianif. Um, IRRX util for the yes. class descriptor table information means do we get the all general resource class names or any additional info? Uh, mean, you can, there's no, that, no that, search that, command. All right. So, 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 right, so, it's, so, so I, I think what that question was hey, when I get the CDT information, can I get the related information? associated with the class? And the answer is yes. Selected. I'm not sure if it's the entirety of it, but there is selected information there. There's no search command to get all the general resource classes. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, there's no search. No, uh, but <laughs> there are some really wonderful samples that my colleague Bruce Wells put out onto the RACFs uh, downloads page. That may be one of them to list all of the ones. So is there a way to do the search command? No, but the way you do that in Rex is do I equals one to the number of uh, entries in the stem variable, right? And then just keep looping through. So it's a very straightforward process. Uh, and I, as I said, I think Bruce has some examples out there on the downloads page. Email me and I'll find you either a pointer to the sample or I will, uh, I will work up a sample. It sounds like a fun one to do. Other questions? Good, we're, I think we're doing well on time, which is surprising for me. All right, <laughs> pervasive encryption. We're gonna step away from, from the RACF support and look at some other things that are going on in, this, in, the, uh, in the ZOSV24 uh, space for security. Uh, and one of the big ones, our colleagues uh, up, in, uh, up in JES2 land now support the encryption of spool data sets. Right? So the concept here is that you will define some key label information on the JES jobs class profile. And that information will include a key label that will be used to encipher, to encrypt the spool data sets associated with that job. The command syntax is there. It's, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, my colleague, uh, Tom Wasik has done some interesting presentations where he's gone through the, the implementation of this. He did one recently at the New York Rack of Users Group. Uh, I will, I, hey, Jamie, is there a way for me to get links out to folks? Because I did publish it in the, uh, it's actually on an, at an FTP site. So I'll, I'll try to find a way to get that link to folks. It's a really good presentation that talks about all the details of how this works. Uh, yeah, what you could do is just uh, add another slide to your deck and then they'll be available for the downloads. Yeah. Great you, idea. Yeah. Great idea. I, I, will up, I will update this thing. So don't, if you grab the slides, don't, you know, don't print them off just yet. Print, who prints? Well, I do. <laughs> uh, but I'll refresh them with that link. It suddenly dawns on me, it's a great piece of information to have. Uh, IBM is doing a survey on what you're doing with pervasive encryption and what you're planning on doing with pervasive encryption. And I know you're surveyed out. You know, here in the US, I, I, I was tired of getting all these calls. I wasn't answering my phone. I just did not want to get somebody saying, would you like to take a survey? So I would like you to take the pervasive encryption survey. But to show you, it, it's it, one of the things I hate is this will take five minutes and it takes a half hour. No, this is three questions. And the three questions are, uh, which of the, of the new 2020 pervasive encryption features are, are you interested in? And there they are listed. I suspect that a lot of folks will look at this list and say, I didn't know about some of the ones that are in here. Well, it's a great opportunity perhaps to go and learn about them. Uh, then the next question is, what are you using today? Are you using pervasive encryption for data sets, uh, ZERT for doing encryption readiness technologies for comm server to understand your connectivity encryption posture. So it's, you know, what are you interested in? What are you currently using? And uh, what are you planning to use? 
three questions. Help us out, please. Survey link is there. Let's talk about identity token support. This is a uh, this is a pretty big change in RACF, a pretty big way of of expanding what we do, uh, which is identification and authentication, one of the key things we do. So think about identities in RACF, right? Your TSO user ID, as an example, a Kix transaction ID associated with some piece of work. How does that work? How does that identity get assigned? Well, sometimes it's directly. We get a user ID and an authenticator, password, password phrase, pass ticket, um, digital certificate, whatever it might be, right? That's the, to me, that's a direct assignment. I'm creating this identity and I'm validating it used uh, based on some credentials passed to me. All right, so I log on to TSO, present the user ID, password, password phrase, whatever it might be, boom, I'm logged on. I now submit a job, right? I don't have to do anything on that job to uh, authenticate that job, right? It knows it came from me. So that's kind of assignment of identity by inheritance, right? Submitting a batch job from a TSO logon authenticated session, boom, there's a perfect example. We have other cases where we will map authenticators, right? An external identity has said, this represents Fred. Or this represents an identity that I have authenticated. And that identity comes into RACF and then RACF maps that identity to the appropriate user ID based upon what the security administrator has told us perhaps, or perhaps based on information that's actually in the uh, credentialing that's coming across. This would be an example of, for example, a digital certificate comes into RACF. We have some rules that say, you can either directly assign this to a user or go through a set of mapping rules that will look at the issue as distinguished name and subject distinguished name in an ordered fashion to come up with a user ID. So that's, that's another way of, of doing uh, identity. And then the last one I'll mention is the case where you have authentication done somewhere else and a trusted authority says, I don't, don't worry about what the authentication is, this is Fred. And they just tell RACF, make an identity for Fred, right? And we are completely dependent upon what that resource manager did to do the validation. So that to me is, is, is truly a, a, a set of, a type of, of authentication that's, that's just assertion. And I, I view pass tickets to be sort of a version of that, right? Yes, it has to map to an identity that's understood by, by ZOS and RACF on the target system. But if you're doing off-platform uh, validation based on that secret key, you've done the validation. It's your job to have done that. Now, with ZOS version 2.4, RACF is introducing a new assertion mechanism, the JSON web token, JSON web token, abbreviated as JWT and pronounced JOT. It's just the rules. So what is the concept of the JSON web token? It's an identity token. It's based on a set of standards that can be used to assert an identity. And RACF support for JSON web tokens will be some, we'll be able to generate them and we will be able to evaluate them for the SAF or the RACF environment only. That's what we're doing here. There will be some rules established in the new class, the IDT data class, which will configure how these things are generated. Now, why would you want to have this? Well, the first one is this gives you the ability to have stateful authentication, right? So let's say you're logging on to TSO and you're using a multi-factor authentication product, right? So what you'll do is you, you log on, you'll probably use the password phrase field uh, to put in some credentialing information, uh, some character, maybe a slash, and then the, uh, the information returned to you by the multi-factor authentication, FOB, token, whatever you happen to have. And that works great. Part of that is your RACF password. Well, you've gotten your authenticator from MFA, right? And it's given you that, that number, maybe six digit, eight digit number. You've typed it in, you've typed in your password. RACF validates the password and says, oh, this password is expired, ha ha. Sends it back to you and you have to enter, uh, you, you have to enter a new password value. Right, so TSO remembers your old password and then you type in your new password, you actually type it in twice and, and you log on. Well, the challenge you have is that those requests to RACF are, are independent, they're not stateful, right? So the first request comes in and it's, uh, oh, here's the password, password has expired. We go back to TSO and say password expired. TSO has to call us again and give us the old password and the new password and that causes us to go out and do the password change. If you're presenting multi-factor credentials, they're valid once. So it came in with the original expired password. Now we're entering the new value and what happens? Oh, the credentials, the MFA credential that you passed in is no longer valid. You just tried to reuse it, eh, can't do that. 
right? So this is, this is, there are administrative ways to get around this, but they're kind of painful. So the solution is that resource managers like TSO can go out and uh, get a JSON web token from the first request and then pass it in on the second request. So it, it, we don't have to replay the multi-factor authentication credentials and it, it brings statefulness to the rack route request equals verify or rack init process. So that's, that's really one of the driving causes for this. Uh, we also have the case of there are resource managers who will go out and capture authentication information and then replay it later, right? I, it, some, I, I've actually seen applications that do this. They'll spawn off units of work that go somewhere else and they'll just keep sending the same credentialing information. Works great unless you have a multi-factor authentication problem, a product, in which case you then have a little bit of an issue. So um, use of JSON web tokens works well there. Uh, these are the contents of the JSON web token. Yet you don't have to worry too much about this other than to understand that it's got some header information that'll indicate the type of uh, validation that needs to be done, the type of signature validation that needs to be done. You'll have a set of body claims, which is the guts of what's in there, what's being claimed. And it has, of course, the user ID, application name, uh, the issuance time, uh, time after which it validates, and then the actual signature itself. So you can think of it as three distinct parts. Uh, this is not IBM inventing this. It's based on a, a request for comments. Uh, when you go out and create a, um, uh, want to have this created, it'll get returned on a rack route request equals verify. And we simply do a you know, classic rack F. We have a rack route parameter list, which points to a data area, which has all of the stuff in it. In this case, it's the JSON web token, or as we call it, the IDT, because we just have to be different. Uh, little subtle changes coming in. We used to say release equals 7708, 77 c 0 77, whatever it might be. It's the FMID, the format identifier. We're moving away from that. And now our release equals will say something like, we'll, we'll say PLV0001 parameter list version. So we're kind of divorcing the parameter list version from the FMID. And the reason we do that is it's always so confusing when we do rollbacks and you have to code the release of, a, of an up-level system to get it to work on a down-level environment. So that's release equals. There are some administrative controls over the use of IDTs and it's the IDT class and the IDT PARMS segment and profiles in that class. Uh, in order to make any of this work, of course, the class has to be active and it does need to be rack listed for performance reasons. Uh, the profiles are of the format, the type of token. And right now that is just JWT. We think we might use something else in the future. Dot the application name, dot the user ID, dot the IDT issuer name. And that for now is SAF, right? So the context here is you define some rules here that'll uh, define profiles here that'll have some rule information for you. I thought I had an example of it. I don't, I apologize. It's things like um, the timeout value. That's probably the biggest one. The encryption token type, uh, the encryption type being used, some other values. My apologies, I will try to remember to add that. Or it may be in the hard copy and it simply made it hide screen. Don't remember. We do time. have a question, Mark. Yes. From Sean, he said, can the identity token support be used for FTP, thus allowing us to use MFA to log on and then not have to use MFA for FTP, or is that really not the purpose? So uh, that, that's a great question. Uh, and uh, once again, RACF is creating plumbing for others to use. I don't remember if FTP supports it. So send me an email or somebody, or somebody remind me, I'll, I'll, I'll look into that and get back to you. But you actually send me an email, M-A-R-K alpha November, M-A-R-K alpha November at us.ibm.com. We'll get back to you. Thank you, good question. You know, just like any other time we've introduced new authentication things, whether it was password phrases, mixed case passwords, it takes a little time sometimes for the resource managers to, uh, to, to fully get on board. All right, and I already talked about TSO, uh, uh, how they use it to handle the cases of, of things like expired passwords. All right, a few other in the minus minute that I have left, uh, we are going forward with common criteria evaluations. We've received it in 2019 for ZOS V2 R3. It takes about a year post GA for us to actually get through the entire evaluation. The evaluation must be done post GA. Those are the rules, but we have the evaluations for ZOS, ZVM, uh, PRISM and uh, details of the common criteria portal. Other things of which you should be aware, pervasive encryption now applies to PDSEs, not PDSs, but PDSEs. 
uh, and sequential and large database, uh, large format SMS managed data sets using BSAM and QSAM, right? There's an APAR for that. And then if you have something that is using EXCP, Execute Channel Program, there are some APIs that you can use to get yourself to being able to support pervasive encryption, but it's not as seamless as it is for BSAM and QSAM using BSAM and QSAM AC APIs. Uh, we have quantum safe digital signature algorithms for uh, ZOS SMF records. Uh, and there was a great session that talked about quantum, uh, positioning yourself for quantum. Uh, this is part of the reason why. You may not need it now, but these records need to have a trusted validation mechanism that'll work once the quantum machines have caught up and are, are more of a threat. Uh, data privacy uh, for diagnostics is a way to configure ZOS so that if you have sensitive information dumps, it's suppressed as it's passed off to uh, folks for diagnostics. Uh, PKI services in Realm Adobe Secure uh, Transport. Uh, this is the last release that supports OCSF, OCEP, and the PKI trust policy plugin. That does not mean it's the last release we support PKI services. It's just this little, little teeny weeny piece of it, but we wanted to make sure. And, and lastly, if you have any applications that are using uh, key eight common storage in ZOS 2.4, they're not going to work unless you uh, install uh, some APARs here that will, uh, will help you identify those in ZOS V2 R4. They won't work unless you, there's an optional feature you have to now get. Uh, user key CSA common storage is a really bad idea. And if you have anyone who's got applications doing that, rather than get that optional feature to enable it, which just does some SAF checks, fix the application. So I apologize, I've gone a few moments over. I think, let's see what we have. Oh, request for enhancements. Uh, that's the link. RACF, you know, if you think it's perfect, that's great, but it's not. So if you have things you want done, uh, click on the RFE. More information sources, the podcast, Martin Packer, Marna Wally, both of whom are speaking here this week, have a great podcast. There it is, Terminal Talk, uh, wonderfully approachable, great listening, uh, love it. The IBM Knights, the Enterprise Knights of IBM Z, short videos, eight to 10 minutes tops. Links are there. They're meant to be introductory, great refresher for everybody. Red books, everybody loves them. Lenny, thank you for plugging the, uh, the uh, getting started with the ZOS data set encryption. Uh, it is a great book. A lot of effort went into that, very understandable. Our folks who do testing, where we bring all of the products together, have a blog, lots of good stuff in there. And uh, that's it for me, a few moments over. Please, session feedback. The link is there, the QR code is there. Uh, I'd like to get invited back. I'd, I'd love to be back in person. The beer is so much better over there. <laughs> Um, and, and of course, the charity. I love the fact that GSE supports charities. Uh, speaker honor, no more, you know, no, no speaker trinkets. It simply goes to the charity. Great thing to do. Uh, please support it. And that's it. So, uh, if there are any last minute questions? Or... Yeah, so any questions from anybody else? I, I've got one while we're waiting. So if, if someone yeah. wants to post them in the chat, so well, it's not a question, really. It's more of a kind of a comment. But yeah, I, I really like the, uh, you know, the ACE. Um, you know, enhancement, the detection of the tampering. And I, I'm sure I have read somewhere, but I can't remember where it was in one of the security standards, maybe it was in NIST or somewhere like that, or PCI, that it states like security tokens, which we all know is an ACE is a security token when all is said and done, uh, that you must have measures in place to detect, you know, or to, to, to preserve, preserve the integrity of it, or at least you know, uh, detect if there if it's been tampered with in some way. So, I guess maybe it came from one of those, or maybe a customer raised that requirement. But I'm glad it's there. I think uh, we we've had customers raise this requirement. It's something we've wanted to do internally, and it, it, there, there was a lot of effort to to especially make sure that uh, all of the software that we know people are running, right, vendor software or IBM software. Uh, was modified, it worked so that they weren't being flagged. So yeah, 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 a lot of work to make it work. Yeah, no, no, great job. And the other thing is around the custom fields. I mean, yeah, it's great that they've now been extended to uh, to data sets and general resources. I mean, I've seen quite a big uptake of custom fields, all kinds of good uses for them to, you know, to document things or to be used as like for 
for decision points for example so one of the clients i'm working with at the moment you know they've got their their identity management and governance solution plugged into uh, to rack f and you know they're using custom fields for things like you know to for to detect conflicts of interest with separation of duties and things so it's uh, so yeah i can kind of think of all kinds of creative things i would say for like data sets and uh and general resources maybe starting with ownership <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, I i will say that one of the things that i, I always feared with custom fields where people finding these the word you used a moment ago was wild and crazy or crazy ideas uh, i remember one client saying oh this is great we're now going to put pictures of our and and i and i thought about that for a moment and said well you know RACF is really well organized for small chunks of data yeah. right a picture can be several k Mm. Right. So we have all of these index structures, all of this caching. What will that do? So I did discourage the client from doing that and perhaps, you know, store a link into an offline store or a, 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 a not in the RACF database store. It's a much better approach. I, my bottom line is if you're thinking about adding stuff to the RACF database, tr please try to keep it small and reasonable and really directly related to security. Yes. Yes, indeed. Um, and we have a comment from, uh, or a question actually from uh, from Lenny. He says, is anyone preparing any sessions on a ZACS? Uh, we do. Hmm. That's a great topic for the next time. So ZACS is a mechanism by which you can scan. It's authorized code scanning, I believe it would stand for. Uh, I, I just mentioned it one line on that top one. Uh, it is an offering, so it's not a for freebie thing, I'm told. But uh, we, we should have a session on that. I, I have installed it, and it's very easy to install and very easy to use. Um, so Lenny, when we do our planning session then for next year's content <laughs> in December, be, be sure to bring that up for the agenda. <laughs> yeah, um, thank you very much. So uh, excellent job, Mark. And for sure, you, you'll be a guarantee we'll be back with us again next year <laughs> for, more, for, more, uh, for more sessions. No, thank you. Um, don't forget folks uh, to give Mark feedback. This is session one. A Y. Um, you can either do that through the QR code that you see there on screen or do it through the agenda. Just click on Mark session just now and uh, you can uh, click on the feedback button uh, at the right at the bottom of the, uh, the content of that session. Uh, Mark sessions are uploaded now, but as he said in his session, you know, he, he's going to make some uh, tweaks to the uh, the content. So just bear with him for a day or two to let him do that and, uh, and then uh, look for the download there. So um, we do have a break now um, at three o'clock. That's three o'clock UK time. You're getting used to me saying that now. Um, we have our next security session of the day, which is with Vanguard. And uh, that's going to be with Brian Marshall, who's going to be talking us through the, uh, the, the common holes um, that they find in, uh, in the Opera, in ZOS and uh, the, you know, the, the, the RACF and ACF2 and Top Secret. So do join us for that. Um, and uh, once again, Mark, thank you very much for an excellent session. We look forward to uh, seeing you soon. My pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.